Years ago, there was a woman who was attending our church and had been attending for a while, but had never joined. So one Sunday morning, our former senior minister, Dr. Gene Owens, went up to her and bluntly said, why won't you join the church already? You're here all the time. The woman replied, well, Gene, I'm just not sure I believe in all this stuff. Gene responded, well, what do you believe in then? To which the woman proclaimed, I guess I believe in love. And Jean said, you're in. <laughs> love is what it is all about. Love is what Jesus was about, what Christianity is supposed to be about, what the church should be about as well. Love is what we at Myers Park Baptist Church have strived to be about since the beginning, to be a people who offer each other and the world love in the form of inclusivity, community, spirituality, and justice. Today, we are loudly and colorfully reaffirming our commitment to love again. That's what our new campaign is all about, love. It's a bold expression of our love for women, LGBTQ people, immigrants, atheists, and those traditionally marginalized by the church. We're shouting our love from the rooftops. Spoiler alert, God loves you unconditionally. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever you believe, you are loved and welcome here. There's a lot of love in our church right now. And personally, I've been feeling the love in a more profound way than ever this year. At this time of year, it's hard, though, not to conflate the love of this community with the love we find on the Hallmark Channel, Netflix, or Disney+. Plus. I'm sorry I brought Disney into this. You know how those stories go on those channels. A woman comes home for Christmas for the holidays. She makes a snowman. It comes to life. And guess what? It's her soulmate. They fall in love and get married and live happily ever after. The fourth week of Advent is not about the love of mistletoe matchmaking picture-perfect families, romantic plot lines, or finding your snowmate in a snowman. There is a greater and more expansive concept of love that contains within it all of our notions of romantic and familial love, yet is so vast and grand it extends to include all of humanity and creation itself. Krista Tippett says that the words that we need the most in our society now, words like Love, compassion, kindness have all been watered down and sanitized and sentimentalized. And so we need to recover a more expansive concept of love because as the old song goes, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. One of the most profound love stories in the Bible comes from the life of Jesus' great-grandmother, Ruth, that we heard today. Ruth is listed alongside Tamar and Rahab and the wife of Uriah, otherwise known as Bathsheba, in the genealogy of Jesus' family tree in the Gospel of Matthew. Many have interpreted Ruth's story as the love story between her and Boaz, as if it was a romance novel or Hallmark movie. In the church, some even use this love story to tell young single women that they need to wait patiently for their Boaz to come along. I find that reading preposterous. As you'll see, Ruth didn't do much waiting. And while this is most definitely a love story, it is not about the love of Ruth for Boaz, but the love of Ruth for Naomi. Long ago in the little town of Bethlehem, that we sing about this time of year, there was a Jewish man named Elimelech who lived with his wife Naomi and their two sons. There was a famine in the land and they were forced to leave their home in Bethlehem and travel as immigrants in search of food and work to the land of Moab. And like most immigrants, even today, they must have been desperate because the Israelites hated the Moabites. The Moabites, you may not know, came from the unholy union of Noah and his daughters. Go look it up. You'll be surprised. 
And Israel considered them the lowest and the filthiest and the most disgusting foreigners that there were. Moab was the sworn enemy of Israel. And in Deuteronomy 23, it says, No Moabite will ever be permitted into the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation of their descendants. Israel believed nothing good could ever come from Moab. But with famine decimating their lives, Elimelech and Naomi had no choice but to migrate to the land of opportunity. It's a story that continues today. While in Moab, Elimelech died, leaving Naomi a single mother raising two sons. Naomi's sons married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth, but the famine was harsh, and tragically, both of her sons died as well, leaving Naomi a childless widow, heartbroken and bitter. With no husband or children, she had no security and no future. So Naomi packed her things to head back home to her hometown of Bethlehem. She urged her daughters to stay there in Moab and find new husbands among their own people. Naomi said, I can't offer you any security, so stay here in your home country. Get remarried to some nice Moabite boys. There's no future with me. The story says beautifully that they all wept together and that Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye and then stayed at home to build a life in Moab. Ruth, on the other hand, clung to her mother-in-law and would not let her go. She loved Naomi dearly and was deeply devoted to her, and she refused to leave her. Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. Why don't you do the same thing? And Ruth responded with possibly the most incredibly beautiful words in the entire Bible. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. When you die, where you die, I will die. And that's where I'll be buried. And may the Lord do this and more to me if even death parts me from you. And so Naomi and Ruth traveled back to Bethlehem together. It may come as a shock to some of you this morning to hear that these incredible, famous words of love often said at weddings were not spoken from a woman to a man or a man to a woman, but from one woman to another. And not only that, from a Moabite to an Israelite. And even more scandalous, from a woman to her mother-in-law. Needless to say, these are not the kind of feelings we typically have for our mother-in-laws. But Ruth and Naomi had become more than in-laws. In the course of the hardships they'd faced together, the shared loss of a husband and a son, they'd grown close. And through those very difficult times, they'd become more than just mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. They'd become friends and companions. Some have called the story of Ruth and Naomi the greatest love story of all time. And yet the Hebrew word for love is used only once in the story, and it is the word chesed. Very difficult to pronounce. There is no English equivalent of this word. Scholars translate it steadfast love or loving kindness, but it is almost always used to describe God's love. Rarely is the word ever used to describe the actions of a human being, but that is the word used to describe Ruth's love for Naomi. Ruth's actions on behalf of her mother-in-law provide a new dimension on what it means to love. She didn't have to stay with Naomi. It would have been totally acceptable for her to go home, find another husband, and not to hitch herself to a childless widow with no means or security. Instead, she clung to her and traveled with her and cared for her and worked for her, even though it meant tying herself and fixing her fate to an unprosperous widow, having no future, drastically limiting the opportunities that she would have. And this means that Ruth was one of the most faithful and loving and courageous people, not just in the Bible, but in history. Our English word love doesn't fully capture the fidelity Ruth displayed. We need a more robust word to express this type of love, a more specific word of exacting clarity to describe the particular kind of love that Ruth had for Naomi. I think we need the word solidarity. 
Pope John Paul II has said that solidarity probes the very core of our being, for it is to lose oneself for the sake of the other. Solidarity is living out the fundamental truth that we are made for each other, born for relationship and community, woven together in a fabric of life, created to be members of a network of mutual care and obligation. Solidarity is an act, not just a feeling, an act of recognition of the inalienable dignity of the other person or group or nation. It sees every person as our neighbor, on par with ourselves, in the banquet of life to which all are equally invited by God. Ruth's chesed, or loving solidarity for Naomi, transcended the bonds of marriage, the bonds of family, the bonds of nation, the bonds of age, the bonds of religion, and it did not end there on the road to Bethlehem. Later in the story, as we heard today, Naomi asked Ruth to do something crazy, dangerous, and scandalous to gain some security. Naomi gave Ruth explicit instructions, take a bath, which in those days was a big deal. Put on perfume. Dress in the nicest clothing that you have and go down to the threshing floor where all the men hang out at night, a place where women were strictly forbidden and go find Boaz. Visiting the threshing floor would have immediately raised suspicions about Ruth's character, associating her with those other promiscuous Moabites. And then Naomi said, wait until Boaz is drunk, in a contented mood and asleep, and then uncover his feet, lie down, and he will tell you what to do. I see some of your eyes getting wider. Hold on to your hats. In Hebrew culture, feet is a euphemism for something else. The sexual innuendos here are impossible to ignore. Naomi was asking Ruth to boldly and courageously seduce old man Boaz. The story says that when Boaz awoke, he was startled. You know, I bet he was startled uh, to wake up and find a woman lying on top of him in the middle of the night. Ruth did all that her mother-in-law asked, and yet, if you read carefully, you'll find that she didn't follow Naomi's instructions exactly. She went down to the threshing floor. Yes, she waited for Boaz to drink and get contented and fall asleep, and she did uncover his feet and laid down beside him. But when Boaz woke up and said, Who are you? Ruth didn't wait for Boaz to tell her what to do. No, no. That's what Naomi had instructed. Instead, she told him what to do. She took matters into her own hands and said, Spread your cloak over your servant boldly asserting her own agency and self-determination by giving Boaz some clear instructions. Spreading a cloak in those days was a sign of engagement and intimacy. Ruth was proposing and asking Boaz to marry her. It was as if she was saying in the famous words of the great prophet Beyonce, look buddy, if you like it, then you need to put a ring on it. <laughs> it was so shocking and scandalous. Boaz could do nothing but offer Ruth a blessing and say, I will do all that you ask. Ruth's actions would be scandalous today, let alone in ancient Israel. And things could have gone a lot different for her. It was very risky behavior. At any point in the process, it would have been completely legitimate for Ruth to ask Naomi a question like, are you kidding? You want me to do what to that old man? But she, she knew how important securing a husband was to Naomi's livelihood and to her own future. And so she continued in a spirit of unparalleled commitment and solidarity and devo devotion to Naomi. Ruth did what needed to be done. She found the strength and the courage to do what was necessary to survive, to secure her livelihood and Naomi's, and the love to overcome their seemingly hopeless situation. 
Because love makes a way where there is no way. If Ruth hadn't done what Naomi asked her to do, there would be no King David, no Messiah, no Jesus, no Christmas. The powerful act of solidarity from this poor immigrant widow and field worker from Moab was enough to change the whole world. When God brings love into our lives and our world, it rarely happens in the way that we expect it to. Love doesn't follow straight paths or take the safest or most obvious road. It is often dangerous and risky, scandalous, wild, and messy. Sometimes love is cloaked in the guise of a stranger or a foreigner providing hospitality to another nation or an immigrant widow caring for her friend. Sometimes love comes in the form of a challenge to seek security for widows and orphans and immigrants in their distress. Sometimes it comes in the call to embrace the outsider, to live in solidarity with those on the margins, even if it requires us to do something dangerously risky or courageously scandalous. Ruth reminds me of another widow named Maddie Rigsby from the novel Walking Across Egypt by one of my favorite authors, Clyde Edgerton. In the book, Maddie is so moved by her pastor's message to care for the least of these, she began visiting a 16-year-old boy named Wesley, who was serving time in a juvenile detention center for stealing a car. Sadly, her adult children, Robert and Elaine, do not like or understand what she is doing, and they become angry with her about her involvement in Wesley's life. Her son yells at her, he's a thief, mama, he's a juvenile delinquent. Maddie replies, but Robert, nobody ever loved him. Robert replies, that's because if they did, he'd steal their car. Maddie begins to say, but the Bible says, and her daughter Elaine interjects, we know what the Bible says, Mama. It's full of wonderful stories. It's a monument to humanity. But that's all it is, Mama. It's just a storybook. But the good Lord says we must help the least of these, Maddie declares. And Wesley is one of the least of these. I'll say, Robert growls, you've done plenty for him already. You've done more than most would. Doesn't the Bible say when we should stop? No, Maddie replies, it does not. The Bible does not tell us when to stop loving. Over and over again, it gives us the examples of courageous people like Ruth, who refuse to stop loving others. Ruth's love for Naomi was limitless because solidarity knows no bounds. Limits, limits are one of those things that Jesus differed on most with his contemporaries. Many religious leaders imagined the command to love simply meant honoring one's parents, loving family, being loyal to one's country, culture, and religion. But Jesus took away all the caveats and conditions, all the loopholes and exceptions, and said, love all people, love all your neighbors. Gentiles and Samaritans, the poor, the sick, the thirsty, immigrants and the imprisoned. He said we must love even our enemies and do good to those who hate us. When someone makes you carry their pack one mile, go with them an extra mile. When you have a party, invite the poor and the lame as well who cannot repay you. Go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor. There are no limits to the love of Jesus who may have inherited his loving solidarity for all people from his immigrant great-grandmother, Ruth. Love is not a feeling, it's an action. And so as Advent comes to a close and we make our final descent into the manger, we must ask ourselves, what would it mean for us to be the kind of people who say to the poor and the vulnerable, the outcast, the immigrant, the unloved, the forgotten, the overlooked, the despised, and the demonized, do not press me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Could we be that kind of person? Could we be the kind of people who say, if you need me to go back with you to Bethlehem, I will go. If you need me to work in the fields for you, I will do it. If you need me to go down to the threshing floor, I will go. 
If you need me to do something crazy and dangerous or scandalous to provide some security for you and your well-being, I will do it for you because I love you. Are we the kind of people who will go the extra mile in love without limits? The kind of people who will go above and beyond for our neighbors? The kind of people who can risk it all without asking anything in return? As Ruth shows, any of us can be those kind of people. So this Christmas, may each of us find our own unique way to embody the kind of love and solidarity we see in the life of Ruth and her great-grandson, Jesus. Because love can make a way where there is no way. And what the world needs now is love, true love, not just for some but for everyone. Amen.